This is what's on my heart. Well, this morning, the title of my message is A Life Marked by Faith. And I want you to take out your Bibles. If you don't bring your Bibles, please, it, it's different than on your phone. So bring your Bibles to church um, and open up. Well, there's a lot of places you're going to be going to today, so just get ready. Our entire life is made up of moments. Some are small moments, some are big moments, some are happy moments, some are sad. We all have moments that we can look back upon and we see these significant markers in our life. And many of us, we can look back on moments and we can see times that were filled with fear and we can see other moments where our life was marked by faith. And today, I want to talk about the truth that we can live a life where we may sometimes feel fear, and yet we can still be marked by faith. And I want to give you a couple examples of this, what I mean by this. When God called us, my husband and I, to plant Collective Church, I was very fearful I think that he was too, but I'll only speak for myself. Um, I was frightened to leave all that we had known and to go into something that was so uncertain. It was very scary to leave our full-time jobs, to uproot our kids from their friends and to what, from what they knew and lead them into this life that is it was full of unknowns and full of late nights, kids sleeping wherever we could find a spot because we had late night meetings um, and just no consistency for their life for a season. And we just had to pray God's grace over them. But it's one thing for my husband and I to say yes to the call. It's another thing to bring our kids along for the ride and just hope that God shows up, right? Right? Also, there was this fact that when we were called to go, we didn't know the week that we leave that COVID was going to shut everything down. And so we were left with no training that we had signed up for. We were left, we had all of these, a whole summer of churches that we were going to go visit. And we, they all got canceled. We were, every, all of us, we were in isolation and so we felt fearful, but we chose to respond in faith. I've had other times in my life where I felt fearful and I responded in fear. Pastor Drew and I, we went up to, we went to Colorado up to the mountains, which first of all, me going up the mountains is a miracle because I do not like that. But I was trying to be a good wife and do things that he likes. If it were me, I would be sitting on a beach with guacamole and chips, right? No fear in the world in that sort of setting. But here we find ourselves, we're climbing up this mountain and he wants to keep going. And I'm like looking down. And he, try, he tries to tell me it was like far out. No, I was looking down like 10,000 feet. And I'll just tell you, I had no faith that I would live to see another day. And so what did I do? I literally just sat down on the side of this mountain. I'm like, you can go. And he did, by the way. <laughs> he just leaves me sitting there. I'm like, I'll be here when you come back down because I'm not going. And one, he's so adventurous that I truly... I don't know if I would have lived through that because he, like, he likes to push the limits. And the other thing was my mind thought truly that I would fall down the side of this mountain. Fear is always a liar. Amen? Fear always blows things out of proportion. And yet we often find ourselves where we give in to that more than we do faith. Fear causes us to say no to the right thing often. We often respond to fear and we run from faith. We give fear all of this attention and faith sometimes it's like we give it a glance, maybe. It's crazy to me how often we trust our emotions and our minds more than we trust the creator 
of our emotions and mind, and we give into this fear and we elevate it, seeing it as our reality rather than the perfect one who gives us faith and what is he promises to work everything for our good. A question I want to start with today, and I want you to write down, do you let feelings be the basis for most of your decisions or the word of God? And I want you to write that down. I like to ask questions because I want you to go back during your week and really think about it. Feelings alone cause us to make the wrong decisions. I've made so many bad decisions based on how I feel in a moment and regret it later. How many of you have sent a text that you're like, I should have waited. I should have never text, sent that text when I'm feeling the way that I feel. Anybody? Okay, yeah. We can't make decisions based on good vibes or what's going to be the most comfortable decision, what's going to make me feel best. We can't make decisions based on hurts or the decision that won't be as painful. And we even can't make decisions based on what other people are telling us to do. We have to base our decisions on the Bible, on the Word of God. And sometimes we say that it was God when in reality, it was our fear-filled emotions. Have you ever made a decision that you said, God told me to do this, or he told me to do that, and really it was just you and the fact that you were too scared to do otherwise? I've heard people say, I need to pray about forgiving so-and-so. Why? Why do you, the Bible says, forgive Period. It doesn't say forgive only in these circumstances or these types of situations. It says forgive as you have been forgiven. We don't have to pray about everything. There are many things that the Bible is clear about. Jesus wrote this book as his very words, as if he was talking to us. And I think that sometimes we say we need to pray about things when really we just need to open up his word and trust him with the things that we know that we're supposed to do. He cannot go against his word. So if you ever feel that you think that God is telling you to do something and it counters his word, I can tell you right now that is not him speaking. That is your lack of faith and lack of trust speaking. So if we want a life marked by faith, what is faith? Well, let's open up Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we, can, what we do not see. Write this down. If you can see it, Say that. If you can see it, it does not require faith. I don't need faith that my kid is alive when they're standing right in front of me. I need faith when we go to Target and all three of my kids feel like that is a playground and they can play tag and one of them goes missing. That's when I need faith, right? Faith is for the unseen and the in-between. It's for those times when the diagnosis comes or when the car won't start or your marriage is looking like it's over or you're looking in your bank account and the money isn't there. Faith is for when you are believing God for what looks and appears to be impossible to our eyes. But when I look to his word, what does it say? It says what's possible, what's impossible for man is possible for God. Faith scares Satan and pleases God. Faith is saying, God, I believe that you can, and I am praying that if it's your will, that it will be. 1 John 5 says that when we pray prayers according to his will, he answers. I want you to hear that. You can write that down and look it up later. 1 John 5, according to his will. He doesn't answer every prayer that we pray with a yes. Just like your parents don't or they didn't answer all of your requests with a yes, they answer with whatever is your best interest. 
my son Elijah, for four years, he, we have tried to get him into a different school with his siblings. And for four years, he would tell us every week he does not want to go to a new school. And he would cry regularly. He knew every kid in his school. He even told me last night randomly, he's like, Mom, I even know everyone's last name that's in my school. I'm like, okay. Um, he knew every teacher, and he does not like change. And we felt that a new school was best for him. One, because the pickup line at two different schools, I was in the car for like two hours every day to these different schools. Well, anyways, this year, Elijah gets into, he starts a new school this week. And so we sit him down and we said, buddy, you got, you got in to the new school. And he just listens, and, and we said, these are the reasons why we felt it was best for you. And he didn't cry. He Afterwards, he said, I trust you, Mom and Dad, that you made the right decision for me. And I was like, first of all, we were not expecting that. We were like, when we told him, we're like, we got to both be home. We got to sit him on the couch. Like, it's going to be traumatic. And he was like, I'm good. And I thought to myself, man, he's 10 and he gets it. Like how much more should we get it when, when we feel disappointed or like God didn't do the thing for us, like for, for us to just be able to go, we trust you, God. And some of us have the faith and trust if he answers how we want. We have faith for what we can see and for what feels safe. We have faith for how we see the story playing out and we run from him and we lose our faith when he doesn't do it the way that we saw it. That is not faith. That is asking God to do your plan, but it's not faith if what? If you can see it, it's faith when you can't. Faith is saying, I know you can, I believe you will, and even if you don't, I have faith and believe that you are still good and that your way is better. Every time I've asked God for something and he didn't do it, I have to believe that it wasn't for my benefit. If God cannot go against his nature, which is that he is good, then whatever comes my way, is for my good. Some of you are thinking, how do I receive faith? Some say that faith is a gift for some and not for others, and there is a gift of extraordinary faith. But let me tell you, open up to Romans 12, 3, please. Romans 12, 3 says, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Did you know that you have all the amount of faith that you need to believe for all the things that God has for you? I'm gonna say that again, it's too quiet in here. Did you know that you have all of the amount of faith that you need to believe for all the things that God has for you. Amen? Yet our minds begin to play tricks on us and causes us to think that we're incapable or that God won't do it for us, but only for everyone else, and that's a lie. Your mind and your emotions are leading you rather than the faith that is already inside of you. I need your feedback today. <laughs> if you would, open your Bibles, Matthew 14, 22. This is where Jesus calls the disciples into a storm. I'll wait till you're there. Let me know when you're there. Verbally. You there? Okay, <laughs> okay. Verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. I want you to underline, go on ahead of him to the other side. Jesus sent them into a storm. 
I'm gonna say that again. Jesus sent them into a storm. Sometimes what looks dark, what feels like the tossing of you against the winds and the waves is not always the enemy. Sometimes it's the Lord giving you an opportunity to build your faith. Jesus knew that the disciples were afraid, but he didn't stop the wind. How many of us oftentimes were like, Lord, stop the storm. And Jesus is like, nope. Sometimes in our fear, we ask the Lord to take away the pain. We ask him to provide a way out. We want an answer. We want him to bring us to a mountaintop. We want this glimmer of hope. And Jesus is like, I'm not going to stop the wind. Use your faith muscle and understand I will get you through the storm. As we keep reading, you're going to see he showed up not when they wanted him to, but at the time he knew best to receive, to reveal his glory. Write this down. This is going to, you're going to have to go back to this and chew on this. I'm not going to explain it. The absence of the storm is not the proof that God is in it. The absence of the storm is not the proof that God is in it. Verse 23, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. It says that they were terrified and fearful. They thought he was a ghost. And I think that they thought that because they didn't actually believe that Jesus was who he says he was. They didn't have the faith that he was going to be there and save them. Does it sound relatable today? Sometimes we can't recognize when God is working because we're so busy being afraid. Jesus immediately said to them, verse 27, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter says, tell me to come to you on the water. How many of you have done that? Lord, if it's you, answer my request. And he says, come. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. When Peter focused on the wind and not on Jesus, he began to sink. And in modern day terms, when we focus on the problem, instead of the one who solves the problems, we sink. When we choose fear over faith, we sink. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him. And finally they said, truly, you are the son of God. Are you full of faith today or do you feel like Peter who's standing right in front of Jesus still asks who he is and if he's gonna be there to save him. He continues to doubt over and over and over again. Do you have to be reminded of who he is because you don't yet know that he's faithful? I think some of us feel like Peter and when we start sinking, we panic and we do crazy things. How many have made a crazy decision when you're in a fearful place? We make these decisions in our flesh that are the wrong decisions because it wasn't God's decision. 
We have to be people that know his word so well, that diligently seek him so much so that the water sinking below us, the storm that we see, it doesn't shake us, but it causes us to focus and to keep our eyes up, focused on what we cannot see, but what we believe him for. When things start to shake, when the wind comes, our faith should grow and not shrink. Amen? The word of God says, if he is for us, who can be against us? It says that we walk by faith and not by sight. It says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. It says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. When you know his word and trust his word, things will not shake you. And if they do, they're not going to shake you for long. When you know him, when you know his nature, everything can be shifting around you. The storms can come right on through. The money can run out. The job can be gone. The stresses of this world can be on my shoulders. But I know a God that says that he's not going to forsake me. He's not going to abandon me or shame me. He is present in times of trouble, and guess what? He's with me today, right now, and he's with you today. That's the faith that you and I stand upon. I want to tell you as a church, we are believing God for some pretty big things. We're believing him for things that look impossible, but they're nothing to him. I need a drink. Pause, please. Can I tell you that God put on our hearts at the beginning of Collective that in the next three years that we are going to plant a church, another church through Collective. We also are going to plant three more churches in the next 10 years. God put on our heart to send out the same amount of missionaries overseas. He put on our hearts to raise up business leaders that are going to lead kingdom-minded businesses. He gave us a vision to have a place where people can come all week long to find community and to meet with business leaders and moms and dads and creatives into a space where they can connect all week long that they don't even know what church is in there. And then on Sundays, we can connect with God. God in services. We have a vision to see the city of Omaha saved. We have a vision to encourage local churches and new church planters and leaders. We have a vision to have leadership interns that one day lead movements. We have a vision for collective worship to reach the world. Are you excited about that vision? Come on. Because you're in it with us, right? We're in this thing together. This all takes big faith. It takes big risks. It takes money that we don't have. It takes people that we don't have yet. And so what do we do? Well, some days, I'll be honest, I want to respond in fear. Some days running feels like a pretty good option. And some days I just want to be a kid again. I want to have nap time like they do. (laughs) But here's the deal. God gave us, you and I, enough faith for the vision that he has for this church. And I believe, I strongly believe that we will do everything that he has called us to do. We don't want to be a church or to lead a church that goes with the fearful, fearful option, but we want to go with the faith-filled one. We will be a church that's marked by faith and not fear. We're going to go places that other people may not go. We're going to try things. We're going to take risks that other people may not try. When everyone's going one way, we might go another because that's what God's calling us to do. We walk by faith, not by sight. And I want to ask you today, what are you believing God for that takes big faith? 
not looking at the risks, not looking at the things that could set you back, not looking at your past or your personality or your mistakes or your resume, your age, your background, not looking at the current state of your marriage, not looking at your bank account, because those are things that you can see. We want to believe God for what we can't see. God can take care of the things that we can see. If I made decisions on what I feel in the natural, I wouldn't do a single thing. I would crawl up in a ball like I did on the mountain and just sit there. But we're not called to a life of just sitting. We're not called to a fear-filled life. We're called to an exciting, faith-filled life. Some of you are afraid that because of what you've done that God is punishing you. And for some, life looks full of windy days and Peter sinking moments. And you're trying to figure out why God would make all of these things happen to you. I just feel led to say the pity party, that stops today. That's not the life for you. We're not, we're, we, we're not like these, we don't have to shrink down. No, we stand tall. We stand firm on the God that we trust and believe in. And I want you to know that whether what is happening in your life is the devil or if it's God, God has a plan for you and he did long before you showed up in this world. He knew every wrong that you would ever do and he still made a beautiful plan for your life. And many in the room, you may be feeling a tug on your heart that God is wanting to build your faith. Maybe you've been doubting. Maybe you've been questioning God's plan for your life. Maybe you haven't seen the miracle yet. Maybe there's a risk that you need to take or an act of faith that you need to do. Maybe you feel like Peter and you feel like you're sinking. Well, you're in the right place today. If we would go ahead and stand, I want to end with a story that I know will encourage you. Some of you may know who this is, Reinhard Bonnke. He was an evangelist. He, was, he spent much of his life telling people about Jesus. He saw 79 million people come to faith because of his teachings. And in the 1980s, he set out to create the world's largest tent in South Africa. He wanted it to hold his crusades. And in those days, if you wanted to have crusades, you needed people to come under a tent. And it took them five years, took tons, I mean, millions upon millions of dollars in fundraising. They had to get these planes that could bring this tent up a mountain to get it to this place. So tons of money, tons of effort. And the day before the crusade, these witches came by and they cursed the land and the event that they were holding. And that night, 120 mile per hour winds came through and the tent collapses. And it's just these metal bars left. All the work, all the money, what looks like God's hand wasn't on it, all of it gone. So fear rises up. Can you imagine taking five years that you've been believing God for this thing and you know that he spoke to you to do it and it's gone. So fear rises up in the team. They tell Reinhardt, we need to cancel. We can't do this. Well, thank God for leaders like him that say, we serve the God of miracles. And guess what happens? He says, we're gonna do the event. The next day, they hold the event with no tent. 100,000 people showed up that day. But the craziest part that I want you to hear The tent would have held 34,000 people. All the three quarters of the people would have been turned away and said, come to a different crusade. 
a change in direction is often God. What the enemy meant for evil, these witches cursing down the tent, he didn't know that God had a plan even in that. God always turned things around for good and he makes an even better plan than all of the money, all of the strategy could do. He's an on-time God and his ways are greater. And I tell you that story so that faith would rise up in you today, that whatever it looks like, however dark it seems, whatever the diagnosis that you received, whatever the pain, whatever the situation, however depressed you walked in today, however deep you are in your sin, we choose our lives to be marked by faith and not fear. And it is a choice. God will not make you choose the path of faith. You have to choose it. We aren't robots. God doesn't make us choose. You have to choose. So today, if you feel fear, we're gonna replace it with faith. We're gonna respond in faith for what we can't see. We're gonna believe God that his plans are better. We're gonna believe him for his promises. We're gonna take him at his word. So I want you to just come forward. If you feel like you need to take a risk, if you feel like you have something impossible in front of you, we're gonna believe that God is gonna turn your story around. And even if he doesn't, we're gonna believe that he's gonna be in it with us that he has a better plan. Come on, is there anybody in the room that needs faith today? Come on forward. Come on, we're just gonna believe him for it. Come on, just begin to open up your mouth. Just begin to believe him for the things that you cannot see. 